Good morning. Thank you for joining us today for the City of Pittsburgh Commission on Human Relations Public Hearing on Ethics and, Race and Religious Discrimination. My name is Commissioner Winford Craig. I chair the commission of the City of Pittsburgh Commission on Human Relations. The commission is a civil rights enforcement agency empowered by Article 5 of the Pittsburgh City Code to investigate and resolve issues of discrimination that has occurred within the city. The commission may study and investigate by means of public hearing and conditions having an adverse effect on intergroup relations in the city. We work to study and address problems and prejudice, bigotry, discrimination, and as it affects the public safety and general welfare of the city. Today, we hope to learn from experts and members of the community about challenges faced due to religious and ethnic discrimination. We have a full agenda for the public today, and we will cover a variety of topics, including the 2017 travel ban and immigration policy of the Trump administration. Um, this has to do with religious discrimination, discrimination in employment, and education setting, community and public relation resources, and sanctuary cities. Those are topics that will be discussed today. Please also note that we will have two sections for public comments, from 11.15 a.m. to 1 p.m., and from 4.30 p.m. to approximately 6 p.m. Next, I will introduce our Executive Director of the Human Relations Commission, Director Carlos Torres. Good morning. My name is Carlos Torres, and I am the Director of the City of Pittsburgh Commission on Human Relations. In the past few months, we have reached out to human rights and human relations commissions to discuss the need to address the effect of recent federal immigration policies that have shaken the lives of immigrants, refugees, and our communities. This commission has a long history of being at the forefront of protecting, protecting civil rights for all people, regardless of who they are, their place of worship, or where they're from. This hearing will assist us as we continue to work to eliminate discrimination and specifically combat ethnic intimidation or any difference in treatment because of ancestry, color, race, religion, natural origin, or place of birth. With that, our first panel will provide information on the 2017 travel ban executive orders and the effect on or at the local level. Thank you. Good, mor good morning. As, as commissioner of the Human Relations Commission and chairing the commission, I will be presiding over the, um, the topic of 2017 travel ban and federal immigration policies. This topic is um, regarding the 2017 travel ban and federal immigration policies. This is um, a policy that's in the news at this moment. And uh, since we um, started to, um, to um, ish or create the agenda for this, we knew that there were um, executive orders that had constraints on this type of um, these policies. But as you know, and maybe our, our speakers can elaborate on the, the change by the Supreme Court in the last few days regarding this policy. Um, there has been some adjustment and also um, it has been concerns on how to uh, administer the new change in laws uh, that the Supreme Court has um, levied um, regarding immigration. So that's maybe one of the items in addition to these to this discussions that um, our speakers may want to um, um, to have to speak on. Today, this morning, I'm joined by uh, Sarah Paris, who's on the phone, and she's with uh, she's a policy analyst with the Migration Policy Institute. Also, Leslie Eiserman, 
Director of Refugee and Immigrate, Immigrant Services with the Jewish Families and Children's Services, and Shayla Vilas Martinez, Director of Immigration Law Clinic with the University of Pittsburgh Law School. The Commission has an interest in ensuring fair and equal treatment for all persons who live, work, or visit the city of Pittsburgh. And we have an interest in better understanding the challenges faced by communities because of their national origin, religion, race, or color. And also to help us, to help us to understand and help us to need to understand what the recent policies are and that, that their impacts are locally, each speaker will be asked to present their case. Each speaker will have, go ahead. So um, Sarah Pierce will have around 15 minutes. What's that? Sorry. Okay, uh, Sarah Pierce on the phone will be speaking about 15 minutes addressing um, the uh, executive orders and travel bans and immigration policy, giving us an overall national context. Um, Leslie Eisenman will be addressing many of the local impacts um, and the ways, the various resources that are available to them. And uh, Shayla Velez Martinez will be addressing um, many of those local impacts from the legal aspect. Um, yes. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> moving on forward, uh, our speaker, our first speaker is um, Sarah Paris. She is um, on the phone. So, Sarah, the floor is yours. Great, thank you so much. Um, so, uh, as you said, my name is Sarah Pierce. I'm an associate policy analyst at the Migration Policy Institute, which is an independent, nonpartisan, nonprofit think tank in Washington, D.C. At the Migration Policy Institute, I study U.S. immigration law and policy. And before joining the institute, I practiced as an immigration attorney at a private firm in Chicago. Um, so as you said, I was asked today to quickly review the immigration actions President Trump has taken thus far in his presidency. The president and his administration have been extremely active on immigration in a wide range of areas. So for simplicity's sake, I'm going to divide my testimony into four parts. First, I will spend most of my time discussing the president's actions on the travel ban and refugee resettlement. Then I will discuss changes on border security, followed by interior enforcement. And fourth and finally, I will discuss changes related to employment-based immigration. So first, the travel ban and refugee resettlement. Shortly after taking office, the president signed an executive order which, among other actions, immediately suspended the entry of nationals of seven countries, Iran, Iraq, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, Syria, and Yemen. It also required federal agencies to develop extreme vetting procedures to screen new applicants for admission and made a number of changes to the U.S. Refugee Resettlement Program, including pausing the program for 90 days, reducing the refugee ceiling from 110,000 refugees to 50,000 refugees for fiscal year 2017, prioritizing minority religion refugees for resettlement once the program resumes, and indefinitely halting the entry of Syrian refugees. The order was effective immediately upon signing and immediately caused chaos at U.S. airports as federal agency, agencies struggled to implement the order on short notice and many travelers to the United States lost their right to enter the country mid-air in some cases. Several court rulings enjoined various parts of the executive order, including a federal district court in Seattle, which placed a nationwide temporary restraining order on its implementation and that temporary restraining order was later affirmed by the Ninth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals. In response to this litigation, the President rescinded and replaced the executive order with a new one. The new order made several changes to the travel ban and the refugee resettlement reforms, including removing Iraq from the list of countries with restricted travel, exempting lawful permanent residents and individuals with valid visas from the travel ban, removing the minority religion prioritization from the refugee program and removing the indefinite suspension of Syrian refugees. The new executive order similarly faced immediate legal challenges, including in federal district courts in Hawaii and Maryland that enjoined the order from being implemented. Their injunctions were later affirmed by the Ninth and Fourth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals, Courts of Appeals. 
The Trump administration appealed these decisions to the U.S. Supreme Court, and this week the court said that it would hear the case in October. It also granted a partial stay of the lower court's injunction. What this means is that the Supreme Court is allowing the travel ban and suspension of the refugee resettlement program to be implemented during the course of this litigation. However, the Supreme Court put an important caveat on that. It said that the travel ban and refugee resettlement changes cannot affect individuals with bona fide relationships to U.S. persons or entities. Yesterday, the State Department began enforcing the executive order in line with this ruling. Refugees and travelers from the six designated countries are only eligible to receive new visas if they have close relatives in the United States, such as parents, spouses, siblings, and children, or if they have formal and documented business relationships with entities in the United States, such as students at U.S. universities or employees of U.S. companies. So, for example, if an individual is um, from one of the six countries and they have only a grandparent in the United States, they cannot currently receive a new visa to come to the United States. The court cases have brought up a number of legal issues, including whether the order exceeds the power given to the president by Congress and whether the order violates the Establishment Clause of the U.S. Constitution by intending to discriminate against Muslim travelers. To determine whether the intent of the executive order is to discriminate, courts have considered many statements made by the president and his aides, both during the presidential campaign and after. These include several quotes on his intention to ban all Muslims from entering the country. So second, I'm going to discuss changes on border security. On January 25th, President Trump signed an executive order on border security that called for a number of changes to immigration policies on the country's borders. These include directing the Department of Homeland Security to construct a wall to prevent all unlawful entries along the southwest border, mandating the hiring of 5,000 additional Border Patrol agents, and ordering the allocation of resources for construction of detention facilities near the U.S.-Mexico border, and directing that all non-citizens apprehended for immigration violations be detained pending the outcome of their removal proceedings. Congress and executive agencies have begun to move money towards the construction of a border wall in line with this executive order, as well as uh, the repair of existing barriers along the border. However, the money allocated currently is well below estimates for how much a border wall would cost in its entirety. Since the signing of the executive order, apprehensions of unauthorized immigrants along the southern border have decreased compared to prior years. However, it remains to be seen whether this decrease is a temporary or permanent trend. Third, I will discuss changes on interior enforcement. The same day President Trump signed an executive order on border security, he also signed an order on interior enforcement. This order made a number of changes to the enforcement of immigration laws in the interior of the United States. Um, These changes included broadening individuals, or excuse me, immigrants who are priorities for removal, as well as allowing officers to enforce laws against immigrants who are removable but are not within the listed priorities. It also directed increased cooperation between federal and state and local authorities on immigration enforcement, and it ordered federal funds be withheld from certain jurisdictions that failed to comply with a federal law on communication between local and federal officials on immigration, i.e. sanctuary jurisdictions. Finally, it also ordered the hiring of 10,000 additional ICE officers. A number of cities and counties have sued to enjoin the administration's efforts to withhold federal funds from sanctuary jurisdictions. A federal district judge in San Francisco has issued a nationwide injunction on this provision of the executive order. Since then, the Department of Justice issued a memo saying that they would interpret the provision to not extend beyond current laws and policies related to the Department of Justice and and Department of Homeland Security funding. So they're going to interpret that provision of the executive order very narrowly. 
And after releasing this memo, the Trump administration asked the court to reconsider its injunction. However, they're still waiting for the court's decision. Since the signing of the executive order on interior enforcement, um, arrests of removable immigrants have increased, especially the proportion of arrests that are, are occurring against individuals without criminal records. Um, since that signing of that executive order, removals have not yet increased, but this is actually expected given the decrease in apprehensions along the border and how long it takes to remove an individual from the interior, um, in part because of our, our backlogged immigration court system. So finally, fourth, I will discuss changes on employment-based immigration. In April, President Trump signed an executive order, <clears throat> excuse me, entitled Buy American, Hire American. Among other things, the order very lightly addresses employment-based visas by calling on agencies to ensure they are enforcing laws to protect U.S. workers, including by rooting out fraud and abuse in the immigration system. It also calls on agencies to, to suggest reforms to the H-1B program. The H-1B visa is a common visa that U.S. employers use to bring immigrants to the United States to work temporarily as employees. It's come under increased scrutiny in recent years as certain country, companies excuse me, have used the visa program to replace U.S. workers. In addition to the executive order, three government agencies that administer and enforce the rules of the H-1B program have reasserted their efforts to ensure that there is no fraud in the program. These actions have caused anxiety in the business community and among immigrants within the United States on employment-based visas. Um, so that's all I have. I'm happy to answer any questions on that testimony. Okay, we greatly appreciate it. Um, thank you, Ms. Paris. Um, if you want, if you would like, you can stay online so you can um, have an opportunity to listen to our other speakers. Um, the next speaker that we have is uh, Ms. Leslie Eisenman. She is, uh, she's from the Jewish Family and Children's Services. Ms. Eisenman. Good morning, and thank you for inviting me to speak today. So Jewish Family and Children's Service has been around for 80 years and does many things in the community, serving people of all religions, nationalities, races, etc. cetera. Uh, it was founded on its work with refugees, of Jews fleeing the Holocaust, and it has been working in, with refugees and has a depth of knowledge working with refugees in 80 years. But we also do many other things, including career development, adoption, psychological counseling, working with seniors. In our work with refugees and, now, and of immigrants, we do the resettlement work. We help with employment of refugees and legal immigrants. We have a robust legal immigration department, and we have a new program with service coordination for any refugee or immigrant living in Allegheny County. So we're talking today about refugee resettlement. A refugee is an immigrant, a subset of immigrants, these are people who must prove to the United Nations that they faced a well-founded fear of persecution based on one of five reasons, uh, race, ethnicity, religion, political opinion, or membership in a social group. Uh, so they're not people coming here for economic reasons. They're not people coming here to join family. They're not people coming here to study. These are people who fled their homeland for fear of their lives. They have been screened and approved by the United Nations uh, Council on, on Human Re uh, Relations. There are 22 million people who have been approved for refugee status in the world right now, which is more than in any time in history, including people who have, these are people who have fled their borders. If you include people who have fled their cities and towns and still remain in their country of 65 million people out of their homes. The number of people who get refugee resettlement is less than 1%. So just giving you perspective on what we're talking about, because I think a lot of people don't realize the scope of refugee resettlement. Refugees undergo up to two years or more of screening, which I would consider extreme vetting of everyone they've ever known, their history, their biometrics, 
in multiple uh, government agencies. Um, so it is, it does take a very long time. They are accepted into the United States Refugee Program by the State Department. The State Department works with nine national agencies. So local agencies like mine are affiliated with one of the nine. Ours is the Jewish faith-based, but most of them are faith-based, not all. There are three resettlement agencies in Pittsburgh, Jewish Family and Children's Service, Northern Area Multi-Service Center, and Ajapo. Together, we, are, we had expected to take over 600 individuals this year. So again, these are not giant numbers, but these are people who are, um, we, we look very carefully at what Pittsburgh, um, our provider network and our capacity to help people uh, on their path to success in the United States. Now um, we are, you know, things are very uncertain in the refugee world. Uh, originally we were told instead of our agency getting about 230 people, then it was dropped to 120 individuals for this fiscal year, and then I was told it was be 160 people, and now I really don't know as of this week how many we'll get, because from what you heard from Sarah, uh, the new ruling uh, will limit refugees who do not have a bona fide relationship. So if a refugee has family member here that they documented, they will still be able to travel for the next 120 days. So what do refugees get when they get here? They get the assistance of a, a local agency such as ours. We have an apartment ready for them. We know something about them before they come. We greet them at the airport. We teach them about life in America. We connect them to benefits. They are legal upon entry. They get an insurance, they get food stamps, and they get a small amount of cash assistance. But someone in the family does have to go to work within three to five months after arrival, and we help them with that. Usually first jobs pay low wages, so we find them housing that they will pay for once they are able to support themselves. We, put, we must put the children in school, we put parents in English class, we bring them to the doctor, and we connect them to resources here. We educate them on their rights in America and their responsibilities. Uh, a refugee is not a, they're permanent if they are law-abiding. So at one year, they become a green card holder. Um, it's a very easy transition. We help them with that if they're law-abiding. And at five years, they're eligible for citizenship. The groups that are coming to Pittsburgh, well, what that we had expected was a large amount of Syrians some Iraqi and Afghani special immigrant visas. These are people who helped the US in Afghanistan and Iraq. Congolese, Somali, and there are some Colombians coming. Since January, there have been zero Syrians, mostly getting Congolese and some Colombian and, and Somalis. Um, and we will continue to help whoever comes our way. The current situation in Pittsburgh, as far as how people are doing, um, overall, when you're a newly arrived refugee, you are feeling, thank God I'm out of what I was in. So they do feel safe from a war, from bombing, and they do feel a welcome in Pittsburgh, um, overall. I would say, our agency has never had so many people step forward to volunteer, uh, donate money and items. In fact, the irony is we have less people. So we're trying to create opportunities and we do welcome people who want to help. So that has been very positive. The atmosphere in the city and the county um, government is welcoming. As far as individuals on the ground, we are have heard of some incidents at the school in particular for girls who wear uh, head coverings. I think that if in Pittsburgh, on an individual level, a lot of people have had heard comments, but it hasn't been like an onslaught that we've heard of. Mostly, they feel a relief in being here. Um, the challenge of resettlement is so difficult. You're arriving, you don't have the language, you don't know our culture, you've lost everything, and you're starting at poverty level. And so um, it's, it's a survival mode, 
And then over time, these people do, as a group, do very well. They're figuring out life here. They're contributing. They go to work. They're paying taxes. The children are getting an education in our schools. As far as supports available, of course, there are the three resettlement agencies. Allegheny County Department of Human Services funded something new called Isaac Immigrant Services and Connections. Uh, Jewish Family is the lead agency with five partner agencies, two Latino serving agencies, another resettlement, the English language school, and a, an agency based in the South Hills where many refugees and immigrants live. So there are supports. This Isaac program, I've left information outside about it, is a place to turn for any need of an immigrant and refugee. As far as what we need, we need interpretation and we need cultural competency at all levels of anyone who's working with people who don't speak our language while they are learning English um, until, especially as they interact with our emergency systems, police, and um, any other kind of uh, medical provider, schools. Um, we need education to our providers, which it has improved, but it is a need. Cultural competency, implicit bias training, and understanding of our own Pittsburgh history of immigrants and what, how we all arrive pretty much as an immigrant here. So we turn to the council to advise us, to educate the public, and perhaps educate our immigrant community on their rights and responsibilities. So that's all I have. Thank you. Um, I have a question for you. Um, in the age of mass media, um, we are looking at technology is giving us some um, information across international boundaries. Um, your immigrants, uh, people who migrated here in, in Pittsburgh legally or um, not legally undocumented, they view everything on TV. They see everything that's going on. In your experience, have what is the effect of um, the, the new immigration policy in regards to um, the mental illness of the individuals, the AS, um, ASD, PTSD? PTSD. Yes. What, what effect the health that has caused um, individuals um, that have migrated here because of thinking, will they have to go back? Have well, they have nowhere to go back to, number right. one. Mm -hmm. These are people who have no home. That's a refugee. If we're right. talking about refugees, right. uh, it's a hard question. Most of them, I mean, they've had already the trauma of flight out of their original country, the trauma of resettlement in camps or in urban areas, and then trauma to come here. And now we're adding another level of trauma. So really, people hold it together when they're in the survival mode. And I think we will see repercussions, just more of... Uh, you know, health issues, mental health issues. One thing I do want to say is we do have funding to do peer-led support groups, which we are running in all the refugee and immigrant communities. Um, not all, but as many as we can find. So I think that's a safe place to get support from your peers in your language. Um, our mental health systems are, are challenging for any local person to access. And then when you add the fact that they speak a different language. They're not used to one-on-one -on -one counseling. So we have, that already was an issue. Um, I think that these are very strong people, um, but they're, yeah, they're another level of fear uh, being added to what they've already experienced. We, you know, there will be an, an uh, repercussion, but we haven't seen that quite yet. Okay. I think that can be, that's a futuristic thing. It's an issue, yes. Mm -hmm. and, and is, um, as as um, an organization that oversee refugees, um, you are preparing for stuff like that. Well, I think another thing I didn't mention is families are now split. So we already got the base of Syrian families here who didn't have a tie, and now the ties are, are stranded. So we are seeing depression from I'm separated from my close relatives. So again, we we will do what we can. There's. These peer support groups, I think, are very culturally relevant to the populations we're serving, who are very family collectivist societies. And, and we will hopefully, as we identify needs, we can help them as much as we can.
Leslie, you were kind enough to come to the my place of work to give a presentation about your services. Could you just speak a little bit about the kind of outreach that's available for other organizations that might want to learn more? So you're talking about people who work with immigrants, Isaac program? Well, Isaac Immigrant Services and Connections is a one-stop shop. You can enter with a concern as a provider or as an individual. We will use language services to connect. We can help with simple, where do I turn for a driver's license to, um, I'm having you know severe problems uh, around my family. So Isaac is Isaac, isacpittsburgh.org, um, 412-742-4200 is a, a way into the program and whether it's again anything that we can help people access it's not that we're gonna hold their hand everywhere we will we it's a teaching we use navigators from the community and we connect to existing services because Pittsburgh and Allegheny County is rich in existing services and the trouble is if you don't have the language and the culture you are shut out of so many things so we are that connector and hopefully people can get served. And usually if we can work with providers and we're happy to train them, and once they get the feel of it, uh, they can open up their doors. And we have seen improvement in this area. Thank you so much. Thank you. Welcome. Okay, um, next on the agenda is uh, Ms. Uh, Martinez, the Director of Immigration and Law Clinic with the University of Pittsburgh Law School. Martinez. Thank you. Um, so I'm Sheila Velez Martinez. Velez and Martinez, both are the last names. Okay. Um, I'm very happy to be here uh, to talk about the work that we have been doing with the immigrant community, and especially since since January of of this year. I what I'll do is that I'll give you some background on what the clinic is and and how it came about. Um, and also an overview of the current landscape. And then I'll turn to how we've seen and believe that the executive orders and policies that Sarah discussed in the, at the beginning of the panel affect specific vulnerable populations, um, women and children, for example, and then maybe have a conversation if you have questions um, about this. Um, I am the director of clinic and programs and also the director of the immigration law clinic. I was able to say until a few years that the immigration clinic was a new project of the, of the School of Law, but it is now seven years. It's a seven-year-old project, and it was created as part of a city-wide effort to attract more diversity in the Pittsburgh area. Uh, a group of funders uh, of the organization that is called now Vibrant Pittsburgh, and you might be familiar with, came to Pitt and said, you know, this is, this is important. We need to have resources for immigrants in the community if we want a more diverse city, and gave the university seed funding, and that gave the opportunity of, of, for the creation of, of the immigration law clinic. Because even with the immigration law clinic and Jewish family and children's services also, there is very limited access to pro bono legal services and low bono legal services for immigrants, not only in Pittsburgh, but in Western Pennsylvania and also West Virginia. The clients that we have in the clinic go from Erie to Morgantown. So we, we represent people all over um, the Western Pennsylvania region as those Jewish family and and children's services. In the way the clinic is structure, structured, uh, students represent immigrants requesting asylum, facing removal in immigration court, um, seeking special protection on the Violence Against Women Act. That's a, a very important work that the clinic does. Um, unaccompanied immigrant children that have come to the United States, and also immigrants that might have other issues navigating the complicated bureaucracy of the Department of Homeland Security. We also work closely with, with communities. We are a very, so our clients include refugees. So we, if, if 
Leslie has an issue with a refugee case that might be not a regular case, so that presents special issues, the clinic would collaborate with Jewish family, and the same with Ajapo and Northern areas. Um, so we are very community-centered, and we work closely, not only with Jewish family, we work closely with Casa San Jose, with the Pittsburgh Action Against Rape, um, Friends of Farm Workers. It's a statewide service organization that is expanding the services that they have available for immigrants that are farm workers in Western Pennsylvania. So we're very happy to, to see that happening because it will it improves um, the, the offer of legal services in a way that didn't exist in Western Pennsylvania before. So one of the things that we also try to do in the clinic is to try to strengthen the, and bring visibility to the immigrant community, uh, to facilitate immigrant integration, because for us the ultimate goal is not, it's not only that our individual clients' needs are served, but that we are contributing to a more open society. Um, and that students, through this experience, become a different type of attorney and a more aware, socially aware, and, and active attorney. So what's the current landscape in, in the city? And we gathered this landscape from our conversations with our partners. So two and a half years ago, I wrote in an article that even though President Obama's executive actions on immigration fell short of the comprehensive immigration reform that this country really needs, they were nonetheless a welcome change. Welcome because they allowed millions of immigrants to come out of the shadows to work and provide for their families, to study and contribute to the production of knowledge, um, and to participate in the lives in their communities without fear, or for, unfortunately. It has been fear what has dominated in many of our communities since the adoption of the Muslim ban 2.0, 1.0, the Supreme Court decision, the interior enforcement memo, and the border enforcement executive orders. And, and I need to highlight this because most of the media attention has revolved around the Muslim ban because it's so outrageous. Um, but it is, it, it's both the interior enforcement order and the border enforcement order that are really impacting communities that were already here in the United States, particularly a community, communities that are perceived to be immigrants regardless of whether, regardless of whether they're immigrant or not. Um, it has created, they have created a culture of fear among immigrants and Muslim communities to the point where children are tearful, are anxious, parents were thinking about not taking their kids to school, second guessing, taking their kid to medical services, to participate in community sponsor activities, thinking about going back to the shadows and not participating. And these affect access to social services, it's access to food, it affects access to mental health, it, it affects access to education, and promotes what the Supreme Court has called, you know, in, in, a, in an old case called Play where so though a cast of uneducated and, and, and ostracized uh, individuals, which is part of what fear what fears does. And Pittsburgh has not been the exception. I would like to say that we haven't seen this in our region or in our city, but I can't. And I'm going to give you just a few examples of cases that we have dealt with. Um, a close friend, this is a, a, a professor, um, had to take her daughter out of private Catholic school because of harassment, constantly harassment about being deported and removed, and uh, oh, yeah. oh sorry, um, and they were not. In, they're not immigrants. They're not even Latino. They are perceived to be Latino. They're actually Native Americans, um, but they are perceived to be Latino. One of our colleagues in the law school was prevented from participating in a panel at a news outlet Excuse in me. Pittsburgh. Um, because he was Muslim and they, they didn't want to have a Muslim panelist. And this is someone that has 
MIT that has that MIT degrees and Columbia PhDs, right? Um, my son in school uh, was yell, get deported Mexican during recess one day at school, never mind that we are Puerto Rican, right? So it's, it's not only, the, it has fueled and it has strengthened those people that already had anti-immigrant sentiment to a way that really affects the day-to-day -day lives of people, right? Um, immediately after the announcement of the executive orders, we started meeting immigrant communities on a daily basis. It was, it was very intense. Um, we were every day going to churches, community groups. We went to every church that has Latino uh, uh, popular communities. We met with the Somali Bantu community um, with lots of communities of faith that wanted to help, even if they didn't have uh, a strong immigrant community uh, among themselves to provide guidance and education to appease some of the concerns that parents had immediately after the approval of, of, of both of the orders. Um, we have also seen, uh, so together with these organizations, we have increased our Know, our right, know Your Rights presentations, deportation preparedness, and you may have seen in the media how communities are now preparing for deportation doing part of attorney, custody decisions, um, financial decisions in the event of being separated because the threat of separation has become more real. And it has become more real because on, since 2014, there were enforcement priorities in place that directed most of the enforcement to cases that involved national security, felonies or other serious criminal conventions. The practical consequence of the interior enforcement memo, uh, executive order and, and memorandum that, that implements this is that every single immigrant that it's not documented, it's an enforcement priority. And officers are um, told and encouraged to detain and process every person that it's undocumented that they come in contact with during the course of their activities. So interestingly, this might include when people that are approaching immigration because they want immigration services. Um, three years ago, and one of the most dramatic cases we've ever handled in the clinic is a, a girl that was victim of abuse by her mother, and she qualified for a U visa, but she was a minor, people helped her, and she lapsed out of her U visa status, and she went to immigration. And she was already out of status, and they called us, and they said, um, there's this immigration clinic, why don't you go there? And that, that girl, now it's an adult, has a child and has a green card, because she, there was relief available to her. I don't know if that would happen now. I don't know if under the new uh, memorandum that implements executive orders, that would be a possibility, that that, that would be this. Um, and, and that is one of our biggest concerns, right? That is an example of a vulnerable population that, it's, that is affected. Um, as in the rest of the country, we've seen in Pittsburgh an increase in enforcement in immigration enforcement, particularly in the areas where there's more Latino community, more Latino population, Beachview, um, and that surrounding areas. Part of the Know Your Rights presentations have been in educating the community on how to handle an encounter with immigration, especially if it's in your house. You don't need to open the door, they need a warrant. So what has been happening is that they wait until people leave for work so many of, of, of the immigrants in the community that work in construction in other areas, they all travel together early in the morning, so they wait until the car is full and then intervene um, outside of the home and in a car where when it's easier and when they have more, 
more people. So that is another way in which immigration enforcement has changed, and that is not the way it was happening since the enforcement priorities had been established in, in 2014. Um, one of the other concerns for our community is how the executive orders are trying to go back to further entanglement with between local governments and federal immigration enforcement. The secure communities, the 287G um, memorandums of understanding, and this type of collaboration has an, a terrible impact in, in community. In, to give you an example, it's really discouraging for immigrant women who are survivors of domestic violence, of sexual assault, on human trafficking from seeking services that otherwise would be available to them and that could effectively uh, save their life. And, and I make an emphasis on women because most of the clients that we handle in the clinic are women and children. And this is consistent with the change in immigrant population demographics in the United States. So right now, most immigrants in the United States are women, 51% of the of the foreign-born population, 13% um, of that population are girls, are undocumented girls. So this is a popul uh, population that it's really, of, should be really of concern. And also because that has increased, this population has dramatically increased during the last, I would say, five years when the increased migration from Central America of unaccompanied minor children that includes also a large portion of unaccompanied girls and family migration. And we're, you're most be familiar with the discussion regarding family detention. In Pennsylvania, we have a family detention center at, at Berks County. Um, so this is also a concern. How this, and just to finish, uh, how this policy affect women and children in particular, it's going to, it's affecting their ability to apply for asylum, to apply for asylum at the border. It affects, it promotes detention of people seeking protection. So there's, there's a group of people that arrive in the United States with already a determination <coughs> that they're refugees. And those are, the, those are the people that Leslie works with. They have already been determined with, to be refugees. But under the convention, the United States has the legal duty not to refuse entry and protection to people that come to the United States fleeing persecution. And that determination of whether that person considered a refugee is done through the process of asylum. So that's, when we, that's what we mean when, when we say asylum. The way that executive orders have been drafted, it dramatically affects that. And it promotes the detention of asylum seekers. And that impacts asylum seekers' ability to obtain, effectively obtain asylum. There's plenty of reports done regarding how people that are detained have a lack of access to counsel, especially regarding asylum cases, because immigrants in Im that are in immigration processes have a right to a, an attorney to no ex, at no expense from the government. So there's no right to have a government appointed attorney. And there's very limited services and levi very limited uh, access to counsel for detained people. And there's a, there's a rather recent report for, at the University of Pennsylvania Law Review that has found that the single most important factor in obtaining asylum in the United States is legal representation. That is the single most important factor. The difference is outstanding from 19% to upwards 60% if you, if you are represented. Um, it, it facilitates criminal prosecution of people seeking asylum. Um, it plays into the hands of traffickers and smugglers and makes as makes coming to the United States more difficult, so it's more expensive, and people then are willing to endure um, conditions that no one should endure to seek, to seek protection. And it tears apart families. Like, it happens, it ha it's happening with refugee families. It also is going to affect the ability of 
refugee children that are unaccompanied children coming to the United States, refugee children that might have already a refugee status determination, but they don't have a significant relationship. And we have in the city experience with receiving um, children that are that were unaccompanied on accompanying minor children and those people now make an important part of our community and, and of the refugee and really sort of sad that uh, sad for the tone for having a welcoming community here in Pittsburgh. Um, it will, it, they also seek to change who's an unaccompanied minor and the rules, special rules that apply to unaccompanied minors to make it more difficult for unaccompanied minors to try their cases and their asylum cases to improve the tent, to have more detention. Um, now unaccompanied minors can apply affirmatively for asylum before an asylum officer in a non-adversarial way. That is going, that seeks to be changed. And, and, and also, it seeks to punish the family members and this, of the sponsors for possibly, for possibly smuggling or facilitating uh, smuggling to deter sponsors and family members. So now what we have been seeing is that if there's an uncle or an aunt here that might be a guardian, they're thinking it twice. Do I, do I really assume guardianship of my nephew or of my son? Is this going to put me at risk of removal or is this point going to put me at risk of criminal prosecution? So we might see the possibility of children staying in Office of Refugee Resettlement Detention Centers, or they're not called detention center facilities, um, for longer for longer periods of time. Um, I think that cities and counties have a very important role to play in in this and and in promoting policies and strategies for assisting refugees, asylum seekers, and immigrants before beyond the traditional nation state, um, to engaging community organizations, to trying to change the discourse, to ver verily create an environment that it's welcoming so people can come out of the shadows and, and, and participate in, in our lives too. Thank you. And that was ex extremely good, as well as our other um, speakers. My question to you is, um, briefly, when, you, when you're looking at immigration and you, you're looking at refugees and when you look at um, people who are coming here, it's on two status. One is legal, one is unlegal, undocumented and documented. And there's a fear of ICE, the, um, the Immigration Custom Enforcement organization and not I and, and when you deal with government when you deal with government you look at uh, the moral responsibilities and you look at the legal responsibilities mm -hmm. and sometimes they they conflict mm -hmm. when you are um, working with your immigrants um, are you talking to them about both responsibilities as far as government and preparing them because the, the law sometimes is different from the moral aspect of it. Are you giving them to understand what the law is so they can prepare? So since 1996, immigration law is very hard. So the, the immigration law changed substantially in 1996 to expand the criminal related backgrounds and to remove access to immigration court and to federal court for a certain immigrant cases. So we have been, the, the, it's not new that we have a very harsh immigration law system. Um, so our clients are very aware of that and are very aware of the limited access to remedies that sometimes they have. So they need also to co be cognizant of that and make decisions that are consistent with the availability of relief. That is why a comprehensive immigration reform bill is so important, because there's more than 11 million people in the United States that are undocumented. And most people that are undocumented are not people that enter through the border without inspection. Um, the, there's many, many people that just came to the United States for a legitimate reason and, and stayed. So 
that is the only way to fully address that is to have a comprehension, uh, a comprehensive immigration reform. But in the absence of that, there's things that we could do. I mean, we can improve the legal services and the education that the immigrant community have because there's many, there's many members of the community that have recourse, but they don't know it. So we need to improve that access, and we also need to work with government organizations to not make it more difficult, um, and then to, to recognize the value these communities have. And I think that that is the key to have a more humane immigration policy, I guess. Thank you. Could you briefly address the conditions of detention for many people who come here? So. Uh, Last week, this, early this, earlier this week, um, one, a federal court in a settlement case, is the Flores Settlement, that talks about the ten detention conditions for minors that arrive in the United States, issued uh, an opinion and order um, in, in the case because the plaintiffs had brought to the attention of the court of the non-compliance with the settlement regarding conditions. And it sets forth how are the conditions, how access to food is limited, to, to healthy food, to medical care, to, to mental health care in detention, how they're overcrowded, how there, might, there have been issues of abuse and physical and sexual abuse, in, in how they're extremely cold and, and how people get further depressed during detention um, because of the conditions of of the tension, so that is a, that is an enormous an enormous concern, and and it's more concerning because what the orders do is to try to foster more detention and to order the construction of more detention facilities across the border, and there's nothing to really address the issues that we already know the tension the tension has. Thank you. I have a question going back to uh, Miss Pierce. Are you still on the line? Did she leave? Yeah, sorry. I was on oh, mute. Hello. I am still online. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm going to come back to you for one question. Um, since you're a policy analyst, um, and, and I think, if, and you can um, correct me if I'm wrong, one of your charges to recommend policies and policy changes. Um, what is your recommended policies towards immigration um, for any administration? For, uh, from your institution? Um, well, that's a very broad question. I mean, uh, at, the, at a very basic level, um, we definitely recognize as an institution that reforms need to happen to the current immigration system in the form of a change in the law. Um, the current immigration system, as was addressed by prior speakers, has facilitated a situation in which we have a lot, very, very large unauthorized population in the United States, 11 million people. Um, and the way the laws are structured, that it has, it has contributed to that unauthorized population. So we need um, a change in the law in that it would start in Congress um, and then eventually be signed by the president that would not only address the status of the 11 million unauthorized individuals in the United States, but would also address the problems within the immigration system that contributed to that unauthorized population. So I would say at the most basic level, that's, that's, that's the recommendation we have. Okay, thank you, Sarah, I mean, Helen. Um, at the organization that I work, um, uh, people apply for food stamps and other basic benefits, medical care, and so on. Um, so how have the recent actions by our federal government affected people's access to those basic benefits, if not in a formal sense, also in how it affects people's willingness to come forward to um, receive things for their children, food for their children, other health care, and for themselves? in ways that uh, ultimately end up having a greater human cost and a larger burden on the overall systems. So I, I think we've all seen a draft of an executive order that... Um, 
I'm sorry. Um, I think that we've all seen uh, a draft of an executive order that would further impact that. Um, but it also has affected people's willingness to go to any government services. And oh, an immigrant woman that has US citizen children, those children have the right to receive uh, government assistance like any other citizen. So there's not supposed to be any discrimination because of the status of the parents when the children are um, US citizens. What I have found uh, recently is that there's also, there's more fear within the government agencies in how can they use the resources on, and a little lack, and lack of knowledge of what the rights of these communities is to receive some services. And let me give you an example. When a woman applies for Violence Against Women Act protection and she gets a prima facie determination, that means that she now could have, should have access to certain um, federal government related services, including the possibility of transitional housing. Um, so women go to, to the office and no one knows, right? So, so no one knows, no, no, you're an undocumented immigrant. And she says, no, I have this letter that says right here. So I think that we need to do also more education within our own government officials to, to have that be more clear because I would I think that some people are stressed and and fearful of making a mistake and giving someone benefits that they are not entitled to. So I think that that is something that we can collectively improve. I would like in closing, I appreciate um, our panelists um, of coming here, taking their time and speaking in behalf of um, this um, this session here. Uh, in closing, I would like to thank our guest speaker for sharing their expertise, time with us today. We hope to hear from the public about the issues during the public comment portion from 11.15 p.m. to 1 p.m. We will adjourn now this section.